with those who are already there and help them to reach their own people and make them disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we give God thanks and praise for that. Having said that, time to dig into the text. We are continuing in our study um, in understanding and embracing the kingdom of God. We are in part six now, and I, I want to publicly thank Mary Lee for the phenomenal job that she does in the background. She does all of our graphics and everything. So Mary Lee, thank you. Now it doesn't mean the rest of you don't do anything but the graphics. That's Mary Lee's baby, and she also takes care of all the text that is posted on Facebook. So we have a lot of people who are working in the background. You may see my face, but there are a lot of believers who are working equally as hard as I do, or as we do here, to take the message to you. Many of them are praying, many of them are just interacting, sharing the good news of Jesus through our um, watch parties. Thank you all. You will remember when we started this study, we had said that Nicodemus had come to Jesus, and he had said to him, um, you are this good rabbi, and no one can do the things that you do except they be from God or they be of God. And Jesus immediately said to him, listen, you must be born again because it's the only way you will see the kingdom of God. And he got confused, Nicodemus, and he said, so Lord, um, how does someone as old as I am be born again? Do I have to go back into my mother's womb? And Jesus answered, and he said, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So to be born again is to become conscious to see that God has a kingdom. He has a realm in which he rules and he reigns, and the people who see are the ones who are supposed to enter and they're supposed to embrace. What we'll be dealing with today, which is continuing from last week, is to help you to understand how it is that we really enter in. Because to enter in the kingdom of God really means that you're changing the ruler of your life. It is not just about the forgiveness of sins. It is about changing who rules your life. Because who rules your life determines your destiny. That person determines the quality of your life. So we are back in the book of Romans today, chapter 6. We will pick up from verse 1. I'm going to cover, I think, close to 14 verses, but our focus is going to be on the first four. And over the next couple weeks, we'll dig in, then we'll get into chapter 7 of Romans because it deals with something that we need to cover. And then finally, kingdom living in chapter 8. So let's, let's read the text I'm reading from the NLT today. And here's what it says, New Living Translation. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Paul is asking the question. Because we are on the grace, should we keep on sin? Should we continue to sin? Should we continue to be slaves of sin? Two. Of course not. So he's very emphatic. Of course not. Why? Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism... And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we, may, we also may live new lives. Hmm. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure, I love that, 
we know, therefore we are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. And he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Hallelujah. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. We know, we understand, therefore we consider, right? Therefore, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Verse 13. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So, use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. And I love verse 14. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. So let me do a quick review for you. And then we'll dig into what we need to cover today. Last week we spoke about the critical question. Which was, should we continue in sin because we are under God's grace? And Paul's response was that it is impossible for someone who is truly born of God, who has truly been born again, now hear me, to continue practicing sin. He does not say that they will not sin. He is talking about the continued practice and let me explain something here. Every one of us struggle with a sin at different um, phases in our lives. Every one of us. For some of us, it's, it's talking bad about other people. For some of us, it's pride. For some of us, it's lust. For some of us, it's, um, it's, it's all kinds of stuff. When you find yourself, when I find myself trapped in a specific sin... Sin has become your master in that area. Sin has become my master in that area. And so that is what we are going to be talking about. What the Lord Jesus Christ has done to set us completely free from the power of sin. So that sin does not rule over us. And therefore we can serve God in freedom. We are, it's impossible for us to continue to practice sin or continue living in sin or continue being in bondage to a particular sin. Why? Because we have died to sin as a master in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, here is what um, Schreiner said. He said, the grace that believers received is so powerful that it breaks that dominion or rulership of sin. Grace doesn't simply involve forgiveness of sins. It involves a transfer of lordship so that believers are no longer under the tyranny of sin. The question is, who is our master? You see, if you've been born again, you have been baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore you are no longer a part of the devil's kingdom. Therefore sin no longer has dominion or rulership over you. You should now be under the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. The same is true for me. That is something that each and every one of us need to understand and only the Holy Spirit can reveal it to us. Whatever area of struggle we are dealing with, only the Holy Spirit can show us that Christ has truly set us free because of our union with Him. So I want to pray a 
simple prayer for us all right now. Father and God, in Jesus' name, we pray, God, for everyone who is participating in this study right now. And God, all those who would participate or look at it later on. We ask, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, that you would take these spoken words, that you would take the Logos, and you would make it the rhema that you would speak to each and every one of us. May we understand and embrace our death, burial, and resurrection in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this is the only way that we can be set free in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Shriner again, he says, We died to sin in that we died with Christ in his, in his historic death on the cross. Those who are baptized into Christ are united with him in his death. They do not merely participate in the death of Christ. And I, I was trying to think of a way how to illustrate this to you. And then I got it. <laughs> if you join the army, any army, you're participating in that army. Okay? You are not united with the army. Why do I say so? Because you could die. They could give you an honorable discharge or a dishonorable discharge. Or you could retire and you leave the army. And once you leave the army, you may have once been a part of it, but you are not considered active duty. Look at what he's saying here. You are united, which means in Christ we are united. We cannot be separated from Christ. He will never separate us from himself, though we may choose to separate ourselves from him. He will not separate us from himself. To be united means that you are anchored in, you are, you are built in, you are engrafted. You are now a part of Christ. I am now a part of Christ. And this is very significant and important that we understand. We are not participating in, we are connected to, we are integrated to, we are, um, we are engrafted into the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what Leon Morris then went on to say. Leon Morris said, Becoming a Christian is a decisive step. It is the beginning of the faith and it means the end of sin. So why is becoming a Christian a decisive step? Because many people think because you said a prayer or somebody led you in a prayer that that is what made you a Christian. But that's wrong. It is completely wrong and it's not what the Bible teaches. How does a person become a Christian? How does a person become connected to and grafted into the Lord Jesus Christ? There is only one way. And that is when you and I believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And that he was resurrected so that we can receive his new life. At the point that we believe... That is when we become Christians. That is when we are grafted into the Lord Jesus Christ. The prayer is an acknowledgement of, but there are many people who say a prayer because they, they are experiencing conviction, but then they experience something subsequently that is called buyer's remorse. Because when they recognize what Jesus demands of people who are called by his name, they turn and they walk away. A true Christian does not walk away from the Lord Jesus Christ because they understand that it is only from Christ and only through Christ and only in Christ that they have life and life more abundantly. There is no life outside of him. There is only death, defeat, and destruction. So, let us talk today about what baptism and our deliverance from sin's power really means. Baptism, and I'm talking now about water baptism, is a very important part of our journey of faith. A very, very important part. Every single person who has truly made a commitment to Christ must it is an important 
imperative they must be water baptized. Now water baptism does not do anything physically for you or spiritual. Well, it does something physical, but nothing spiritual for you. But it is an affirmation. It is a confirmation of the internal work that was already done when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the early church, they did not go through a lot of teachings before they were water baptized. And I want to explain why. Because in the modern church, we have changed that. Today, what we do, we put people into a class and we explain to them the church's doctrine or the denomination's doctrine. That is not what happened in the early church. In the early church, as long as you confessed faith in Jesus Christ, and when I speak of confessing faith, people did not enter into that lightly because their lives were on the line. When I speak, they could be killed. Definitely, they could be ostracized by their family. And if they were coming out of Judaism, it means that they lost contact with the, the synagogue or the temple. They, so they, there was a lot at stake and people did not enter into it lightly. Unlike today where it is popular to go to church, it is popular to sing so-called Christian songs and all of that. And people think that because they do these things or they follow some preacher or some teacher or some prophet or, or whatever it is, that that is what makes them a Christian. No. What makes us a Christian is if we believe who Jesus really is and what he has done for us. And we embrace him, therefore, as our Savior and Lord. Because when we believe, we have to change who governs our rules or who is the Lord of our lives. So water baptism is a, an affirmation or it's a public statement that is why it was done in those days in a public place because it was a public testimony to everyone in the community that now I used to live that way, but now I am going to be following in the footsteps of Jesus. Therefore, water baptism was really the initiation it was the starting point where you were telling people, I am now going to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you heard me, yes. I am now going to become a disciple, a student of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I will be following in his footsteps. And so you find 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 says, If anyone truly says that, or if anyone says that they have a relationship with God, then they need to live like Jesus lived. That means they pattern their lives after the Lord Jesus Christ. When we are getting water baptized, we are telling the whole community, everyone in our lives, that is why I said it was done publicly, that look, I am going to follow Jesus now. I am done with the old life. For us today, we think about a cute little frilly, frilly white dress because we are going to offer our child. And people think that in offering your child that the child is baptized, the child doesn't understand. That is why the child doesn't understand what baptism means, what death, burial, and resurrection means. So what you're really doing there, you're dedicating or offering your child to the Lord. But that there is not the same as water baptism that is connected to a commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. For adults, you might get a nice t-shirt like I have one when I served on the, um, at the other church. I have one that said, I have decided, or I decided, which meant I decided to follow Jesus. And so when we were going to baptize people, I put on my shirt, the lead pastor, Pastor Johnny, put on his shirt, and all the baptismal candidates, they put on their nice blue shirt, I have decided. Some of them decided until they came up out of the water and they went back to their old master. That is not what water baptism really symbolizes. Here is the text now. Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, now notice, we join him in his death? So you see, there are two things. Let, let me bring up this slide. Here 
is what Leon Morris said. He said, if Paul's readers do not understand what it means to die to sin, they do not understand what baptism means, and baptism comes right at the beginning of the Christian life. It's not later down after you finish a course or your church's doctrine. You must understand that baptism symbolizes that you understand that you have died to your former life. You have died to sin in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you're participating in that which symbolizes it so that the world would see. And now when you come back up out of the water, you are resurrected. You're saying, I'm now resurrected to newness of life. I've changed government. I've changed the ruler or the king of my life. And so now I'm going to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And you begin to go through the process of discipleship. That is why Christians live in community. They are not lone rangers. Another quick thing I want to say here. Those of us who are privileged to be teaching you on whether it's on Facebook or social media or by radio, we can only do so much. You have to be connected to a local church and all that presents all kinds of challenges because with the COVID-19 we can't meet as a community like we used to meet in the past. But you need brothers and sisters in your life where you're speaking into their lives and encouraging them to live for the Lord. As you're modeling Christ before them, they are also modeling Christ before you. No Christian can truly be successful and become like Christ if they don't have other Christians speaking into their lives and setting an example for them. None, period, nada, zilch. It's impossible. That is why God put us into communities of faith. Can I get a good A? Amen. 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 So watch now. The Apostle Paul, here's what he was saying. We were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, and therefore we join him in his death. Now I've said to you that there are two things that are involved here. Frank, let me bring up this next slide and then I'll talk some more. Leon Morris went on to say, when applied to Christian initiation, we ought not to think in terms of gentleness and inspiration because baptism means death, death to a whole way of life. See, this is baptism. I'm not talking just water baptism. I'm talking about the initial baptism. When you came to Christ, there is a transformation that took place because why? You suddenly recognize the whole world has changed before you. And so now you, you have seen the kingdom of God and you want to enter the kingdom of God. So you start off on this journey and all of us remember when we were first converted, there was so much joy. We were singing and bouncing. There was a step in our life. There was a spring in our, in our steps and, and we were happy and we were singing hallelujah, praise God. And, and no matter if people spat in our faces, we would still lift our hands and say, thank you, Jesus. That was then. This is now. Because what happens after that initial phase, because we really don't know what took place, we just had the joyful experience of being born again, but we didn't understand what it means. So what happens then is that our old life, our carnal nature, our Adamic nature now began to come back because that dude doesn't like to stay dead. You know, in my backyard, in my garden plot there, there is a type of grass, I really don't know the name, but that grass scares the living daylights out of me. If there is a single joint, yes, a single joint, if a joint of that grass is left in the ground, it will catch back and over time reinfest the entire garden. So when I was taking in the section, for those of you who know my backyard, when I was taking in the section that runs parallel to Tarragon, the main street, there was a section there that we had prepared, but not I hadn't completed it. And so when we were putting in the mulch, the wood chips, my son and my grandsons, they covered the entire thing. And I said, no! You can't cover that thing up. 
Please remove all that covering that you've put on it. Hear me, Christians. Remove all that covering that you've put on it. And they looked at me and said, why, Grandpa? I said, because that thing is going to infest the entire garden. So Grandpa got two sponges, and he went down on his knees, and for like three hours, he was digging all these things one at a time, and putting them out of the gardening section. Now here's an interesting thing about this particular grass. When it can't get through at the top, it grows under the soil. So I could not just remove the ones I was seeing on the surface. You hear me, Christians? I couldn't just remove the ones I was seeing on the surface. I was down on my knees. I had my little hand rake. And I was digging up and I had on my gloves and I was pushing my hand in. I was sweating profusely. My Everything was wet for me. But I needed to get out every single piece of that grass. Why? Because if I did not, it was just a matter of time. As my plants are coming up, that grass would begin to reappear re, um, and it would reinfest the entire garden. Many of us, we settle for just going to church. We settle for just reading our Bibles. We settle for just praying and fasting and, and speaking in tongues and laying hands on the sick. We are not paying attention to the stuff that is going on beneath the surface. When we become reunited with Christ, remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter. You see, when you're entering the kingdom of God, you've got to deal with the stuff that is beneath the surface. <laughs> I'm tempted to stop here and just talk to you from my heart. Perhaps I should. Listen to me, please. Our fruitfulness in the kingdom of God is largely determined to the degree we are prepared to die. I want to say that again to you. Our fruitfulness in the kingdom of God is to a large degree determined by the extent to which we are prepared to die. I have shared with you before that Dr. Artie Kendall said that the majority of Christians, some 90-something percent of us, we never grow beyond year two of our conversion. In other words, for the rest of our lives, because we are not allowing the Holy Spirit to do the deeper internal work in our lives, we remain two-year-olds. Have you ever seen a two-year-old in action? They always want. They're always demanding. They're always pointing out other people's faults. They never see their own. They are never taking responsibility to contribute. They are only looking to get out of. Many of us remain in that place. And here, here's a, the longer we are in the church, the more dangerous it becomes for us to remain stuck there. When you ask one of us who is stuck in that two-year mindset, would you help us to do something? I have to pray about it. The moment you hear a Christian tell you, I have to pray about something that is a routine stuff, nobody asks you to go off on the missions field we are taught, well, yes, even in that, you don't have to pray about going on a mission field. Why? Because your mission field is where you live, your own home, the community where you live, the place where you work. You don't need to pray about that. Why? Jesus already told us that is required of a disciple. If somebody asks you, could you help us to teach a Sunday school class? I got to pray about it. But you're doing anything. Every time I got to pray about it. You are stuck in a two-year-old mindset. I'm stuck in a two-year-old mindset. If somebody asked you, can you give a glass of water? I got to pray about it. <laughs> you are stuck. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So, so, baptism, the external thing, 
really speaks of an internal work that has begun and will continue as we submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so let, let me go on here now. At baptism, that is at conversion, this is Schreiner, the death of Christ becomes ours because we share the benefits of his death by virtue of our incorporation into him. We are not participating in Christ. We are engrafted into the Lord Jesus Christ. And because sin does not have dominion over Christ, Sin cannot have rulership over you and I. May the Holy Spirit give us revelation in this. So salvation isn't anchored in baptism, but in the death and resurrection of Christ. Let me go further now because of time. I really wanted to finish this today and we ain't get there yet. But it, it's so important that you get this into your spirit. It is so important that I truly grasp it because it was... When I was really battling sin, and I'll just be candid, I used to struggle with lust. I, I used to struggle with covetousness. I used to struggle with envy. And the truth is, it was not until the Lord opened my eyes to Romans 6 that I died with Christ in these specific areas that it began to change for me. You will never change until the Holy Spirit opens your eyes. So, <coughs> excuse me, 6-4. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. What a baptism now. Now notice, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also, now watch the word, may live new lives. Now he did not say shall, but he said may. Why is that word may so important in there? Because you have a choice. So um, let me bring up one more slide and then I'll talk with you. And by God's grace, we'll just continue next week. The purpose, now this is my quote. The purpose of our union with Christ is really our death to sin and resurrection with him to newness of life. That's my, my quote. I branded it. Meredith, please brand it there for me also. Here's what I want to say to you for today. Because we are united with Christ, sin no longer has power over us as our master. It does not mean that we will not be tempted. However, because we died with Christ and the power of sin as the master has been broken, the chain has been shattered. There are no shackles on our hands. There are no shackles at all, not emotionally, not physiologically, not in any way. All of that has been shattered because we're united with Christ. Temptation will come. But you see, now we are not helpless. So we, let us say we're in the middle. Temptation, you know, they have these images where you, on the one side, you got this little red guy on a, with a pitchfork. And on the other side, you got the guy dressed in white with this halo around his head. And both of them are whispering in your ear, and you're the one in the middle. Temptation comes to all of us. Now, why are we tempted? We are tempted in the, only in those areas that we have not yet submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have not yet embraced his rule. If we have embraced his rule, we will not be tempted in that area. It, it doesn't have any power. Temptation comes out of desire because that's what temptation is, desire. But in the past where our desire was overpowering us, now the desire does not have the ability to overpower us. The sin cannot just, just command us to go. It entices us because it's a desire that we have. The Bible says that there had no temptation overtaken any of us, but such as is common to all men. God will, with every single temptation, make a way for us to escape. So back to my little imagery. You're in the middle. On the one side, 
is the guy with the red fork temptation saying, go do it, go do it, whatever it is. On the other side is the Holy Spirit saying, you do not have to yield. You can stay quiet. You don't have to respond. Who do you think has the power now? God has restored to us that power. So we now have the power of choice. That is why none of us will ever be able to stand before God and say that God, I couldn't help myself. Why? Jesus, through his death and resurrection, liberated us from the power of sin. So now sin does not control how we live and that is why Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, if you learn to walk in obedience to the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. In other words, you will be experiencing more and more of the kingdom living. Who gets to choose? You get to choose. I get to choose. Who does not have power over us? Sin, and therefore the devil or Satan does not have power over any believer in Christ. None whatsoever. That's why true Christians, those who are maturing in their faith, are not fearful of demonic forces. No, they are, they are, they are conscious of it, but they recognize their authority in the Lord Jesus Christ, so they don't run around monkeying around the place. But they understand the authority that they have, and through their submission to Christ, they exercise dominion. But they don't run around the place behaving anyhow, because sin is not their master. The one who is their master is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has given to each and every one of us his spirit. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit is twofold. Number one, to reveal to us the things that God has in store, God has already given to us, that's the, according to 1 Corinthians. And the second thing is to empower us so that we can triumph in every area of our lives. That is why I keep saying in every message that I give that we all need to embrace the work of the Holy Spirit. We all need to become increasingly conscious of His voice and learning to submit to him. You see, Paul said in Romans 8, 14, that as many of us as are led of the Spirit of God, we are the children of God. Ipso facto, it means that if you and I are not being led of the Spirit of God, then the question is, are we really children of God? Have we really entered the kingdom? See? So, just for today, just for today, understand that sin is no longer our master. Why is sin no longer our master? It is no longer our master because in Christ, because we have been engrafted in Christ when we believed in Him, at that point in time, sin's power over our lives was broken. But many of us have gone years and because we have not been discipled, we have not been taught the things that Jesus said. What did Jesus say about discipleship? Matthew chapter 20, verses 19 and 20. He said, make disciples of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then what else? Teaching, continuous, teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you. And he said, as we are doing that, baptizing and teaching, he will be with us even unto the ends of the age. So here it is now. We have been walking in the Lord for several years, still in bondage to sin, serving sin as a master, simply because we have not been taught. We are not being taught. And you cannot be taught unless you're in a discipleship relationship. This is beyond church doctrine. This is understanding what Christ did for us on Calvary. And when he rose from the dead and he gave us his spirit. For you died with Christ and your life is now hid with Christ in God. That's according to Ephesians. We are free from the power of sin. And now we don't have to continue practicing.
this in sin, we can live for the glory of God. Why? Because in Christ you've been resurrected to newness of life. And so I'm going to teach you the next time we come together, how do we go about practicing the newness of life. Resurrection life, kingdom living, all empowered by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I really pray that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. That you could see in the specific areas of your life where you've been in bondage, that you're no longer in bondage. You're free. Walk out of it. You've been emancipated. You've been set free. But unlike the emancipation that took place here, not only are you emancipated, but you're being empowered by the Holy Spirit to truly live for God. Why? Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth sets you free. Truth is what sets us free. Let's pray, please. Now you can come to the Father with boldness. I can go to the Father with boldness. Father and God, today we thank you so much for the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for giving us a rhema word. Not the word that I spoke, but the word that your spirit spoke into the hearts and lives of each and every one of your children, even as he's speaking to me. God, we pray that the liberty of the sons of God would be ours, each and every one of us. Those who are on the broadcast right now, God, those who will join the broadcast later, God, may your spirit take your word and just speak a rainbow word into all of us, God, that our faith would come alive that our minds would be renewed so that our lives could be transformed and we would all live for your honor and your glory. We give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So then let me say for um, Wednesday night, I think that's the, what, the 8th? Now on Wednesday night, we'll be going back into the book of Revelation. I'm kind of excited. You see me smiling. <laughs> I'm kind of excited because on Wednesday night, we're going back to Revelation chapter 5. And remember when we closed, John said one of the elders turned to him and he said, John, do not weep anymore. For behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Yes, the seed of Jesse, he has prevailed and he is able to open the book or the scroll and to read the contents thereof. But when John turned around, which is what we'll be talking about this week, when John turned around, he was looking for a lion, but he saw something else. What does that mean? Hallelujah. Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here, Renew and Transform Ministries. Thank you so much for joining us. We truly love you with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Share the love of Jesus with other people. No one who has truly experienced freedom in Christ can keep it to themselves. They have to share with other people. It's like the woman at the well. Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Is not he or is not this Jesus the Christ? He is Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the one who set us free. See you on Wednesday, 7 p.m. Have a blessed rest of the day. Bye for now. Oh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and be gracious unto you. May he watch over you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name. Bye now. Ian Taylor signing out. <laughs>